Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I'm Thomas V. Miras. This podcast is an offering to the Holy Family and, less importantly, a production of CatholicCulture.org. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Today's episode has been a long time coming since the very beginning of the podcast, and it's strange that the the topic we're going to be discussing today is one of the most requested from listeners, despite the fact that Gene Wolfe, the great Catholic sci-fi author, though very well known in sci-fi circles, is not well known at all outside sci-fi circles, and yet a number of listeners have requested that I do an episode on Gene Wolfe. A few years ago before I launched the Catholic Culture Podcast, I uh, wrote an article. I read his most famous work, The Book of the New Sun, and I wrote an article about it for Catholic Culture. And later that year, I was playing piano on a cruise ship, and I met this older couple who were readers of the site, and, and the the husband specifically mentioned Gene Wolfe to me as someone he was very interested in. Then, right after I launched the podcast in 2018, one of my first pieces of feedback by email was from a young, recently ordained priest who was just outside of New York City, and he suggested I do an episode on Gene Wolfe. And at the time, Gene Wolfe was still alive, and his just based on the, the kind of guy he was, you know, his, his number was still in the yellow pages. And so I thought, maybe I could interview him. But then I thought, you know what? I feel like I would want to read a lot more of his works before I would take that step to try to interview him. And then last year, I guess about a year ago now, he passed away. And again, you know, I thought I better do a tribute episode to Gene Wolfe. And again, I set my bar for research way too high, and it kind of fell through the cracks. And then just recently, I, I got another request by email from a listener saying, you should do an episode about, episode about Gene Wolfe, and you should have Father Brendan LaRoche come on to talk about him. So I thought, you know what, if I set the, the standard so high for research for myself, this is just never going to happen. So I better just bite the bullet and do this and, and rely on my guests to fill in the details. Now, in the midst of my conversation with Father Brendan, I'm going to be dropping in some little clips of me talking to Sandra Meisel, a sci-fi critic who was friends with Gene Wolfe, so she'll be providing us with some nice personal reminiscences of the man. So uh, Father Brendan is a priest in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and the chaplain of the Newman Center at Muhlenberg College. Father, I'm happy to have you on the show to talk about Gene Wolfe today. I'm happy to be here. Uh, really, I like talking about Gene Wolfe. It's one of my favorite things, right up there with talking about Tolkien. I hope your listener, who suggested me, didn't put more faith in me than is warranted, but we'll see. You know, and I uh, really do enjoy uh, his work. It's, it's like Tolkien, it's excellent just as uh, excellent work that not only is excellent within the genre of science fiction and fantasy, but that, can re- that really transcends the genre based on the skill of the authors. But also for both those authors as Catholics, we can draw a lot out of this because their faith is in their works present, uh, though not always in the most obvious way that you would think of in like uh, what is contemporarily called Christian fiction. And uh, I always thought my experience reading Gene Wolfe is very much, um, I believe it was C.S. Lewis, Tolkien's friend, who said that you know a great book because it's always worth going back to and reading again. And usually the first time I read a Gene Wolfe novel, I come away going, I really like that, but I don't understand it. And then I'll go back and then I draw more out. He has this quality to his writing and and not all of it is equally esoteric. You know, I, I find some of his short stories are easier to understand than his most famous novel. But, you know, he has this interesting quality where you read it and you go, boy, I don't, I'm not sure that I know what happened in that story, but it was really entertaining. So it kind of like has this, it functions somehow as pulp on the surface, and yet it's also has layers upon layers, you know. That's very true, and I think that's intentional. You know, if you look at some of the kind of, Pre-Tolkien or contemporary with Tolkien, uh, certainly with Tolkien getting big in the United States, you get authors like um, Jack Vance, the Dying Earth uh, series of short stories, and Book of the New Sun is in some sense very much kind of a, a, is a Dying Earth series in the similar vein. Paul Anderson with 
Three Hearts, Three Lions, uh, about a, a modern man getting transported kind of back to a medieval fantasy world, and that's very much what happens in, for example, the Wizard Knight duology. So he has this working within his genre, working within the traditions of science fiction and fantasy, and some of the more kind of uh, pulpy origins, and yet really drawing out, really drawing out very deep things if you're willing to put the effort in, and yet ultimately enjoyable even if you don't necessarily put that effort in. Uh, you know, if you don't track down his literary references, get the lexicon Earthis or, or use your ebook reader to constantly Google for what does this word mean originally? But very much worth it and just a, a excellent what he does. And his short stories, I always recommend people start there if they're not sure if they're going to like him because some of them very much are straightforward. And yet you'll see those techniques he uses to greater detail, I think, in his longer works present in them, which then allow you to kind of on a almost like draw the analogy, like, you know, you go in the waiting pool before you jump in the deep end. The short stories kind of give you experience with those in a way that's much easier to understand. Much easier to kind of, oh, I see what he's doing there. I get that. And also for you to feel that you haven't sunk however long it takes to read all four volumes of the Book of the New Sun. Plus, if you really want to go full solar cycle, the coda of Earth of the New Sun, and then the Book of the Long Sun, the Book of the Short Sun, and spend however many days, hours, years, whatever, going through all those Another author, it, it occurs to me to compare him to, and this is partially because I just read his long short story, The Fifth Head of Cerberus. Uh, I mean, I, I literally just read this in the past couple of hours. It's very evocative, and it reminded me at the beginning of Ray Bradbury, actually. And uh, not only in that, in the atmosphere it creates, the reflections on childhood and things like that, but also in that you could call Bradbury a sci-fi author, but it doesn't really do him justice. And and he's he's also not, you know, someone who's like inordinately concerned with the science aspects of it. Now, I think Wolf is more concerned with those things, but, you know, he also is just writing these very evocative, atmospheric, mysterious tales at the same time. I mean, Bradbury's work is simpler, but I, I don't know. I think I think there's a kinship in some way between the two. No, oh, I completely agree. I, th I think he said at one point somewhere that uh, I think he mentioned particularly the Martian Chronicles, um, the kind of linked short stories that Ray Bradbury put together then as, a, as a novel. And there is very much that kind of, that kind of, especially of tone of the what he can invoke with those things about making you remember, you know, and, and that, that remembrance is kind of important. You know, I mentioned in one of our emails, the, the little article, the article. Yeah, I read this earlier. Cecilia, Cecilia Michelle Lopez, where she compares Book of the New Sun to like, you can take medieval kind of ways of reading it, that'll get you something different from very modern ways. And that's, talks about that being intentional. But one of, uh, one of the things she talks about is in liturgical, the idea of an amnesist, that deep remembering that liturgy brings out that makes you a part of a past. And I, so I think that that evocative quality that, that Bradbury certainly has, which is why his short stories and uh, are so wonderful. I think Wolf very much does have that and uses that. Uh, but he is, you know, he is more, um, he is more concerned with the science in the sense that, I mean, that's his education. He's a was a mechanical engineer, uh, I believe. It was, uh, in fact, um, if you ever look at the Pringles man, he's basically a caricature of Gene Wolfe um, with that mustache and everything because Gene Wolfe in, uh, basically invented the machine that allows, as the old uh, Pringles commercials would say, that allows you to bag those bags with busted pieces because the tube just gives you, that's, you know, even if, People forget Gene Wolfe, and I don't think they will. I think Ursula Gwynn is very correct in comparing him to Melville in some respects, as the Melville, if you will, of, of uh, a science fiction fantasy. Uh, the Pringles Man will probably be around for a while, and so people will see the face of Gene <laughs> Wolfe all over the place, even if they don't know it. That's fantastic. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. Another, another writer he reminds me of at times, sometimes in his prose and sometimes in his logic, is Chesterton. There's a, a couple of passages which, I don't know, might read at some point uh, during this conversation in the Book of the New Sun, which it's like, okay, that's a sentence right out of Chesterton, you know? I'm particularly thinking of the th the thorns uh, passage about every thorn being a, a sacred thorn or that stuff, uh, which maybe we'll return to later, but certainly he has a lot of that vibe at times. And uh, I will say one of the big things, I think The Man Who Was Thursday, especially of Chesterton's fictional work is influential. On him, he has talked in various interviews where he's mentioned things about uh, uh, Chesterton's influence. But like, The Man Who Was Thursday is a novel that seems to be one thing, then becomes another. 
And yet at the end of it, when you put it all together, you might not have been able to figure it out on the first go because you weren't thinking that way, but everything kind of clicks. And I think that's very much in the way, that way, especially in that novel, the way Chesterton plays out The Man Who Was Thursday, I think it very much plays to some of the, the things that Gene Wolfe does, in especially in a lot of his fiction, but especially in, in longer and, and I would say the more obviously when you dig into them, Catholic works in some ways, like certainly the, the Sun Cycle, Book of the New Sun, also I think with The Wizard Knight, Latro, uh, to some respect, the Soldier series, you know, which has one of my favorite passages of all time. I think it's in them. Um, they're on my reread list after I go back through the Solar Cycle and go through the Wizard Knight again. But there's a um, Latro. So for those who don't know, Latro is a Roman soldier who is fighting in Greece, and he gets an injury, and he no longer can um, process short-term memory into long-term memory. So the Latro books are are basically. Latro scroll that he writes at the end of each day to remind him what's going on and and with all the unreliable kind of postmodern narration tactics that allows for natural Latro sometimes loses his scroll for a couple days and and he starts it up again and people have told him they're different than what they are uh, or who they told him last time but the other thing it allows him to do is to see the the gods you know the spirits um, and there's a, I think it's in the second book Soldier of Arate there's this discussion um, and somebody is, he's talking with some people and, and the one guy, and this is, this is where I began to beat the drum that I beat sometimes when people talk about Gene Wolfe, about him being a, a Christian Platonist. Somebody says something to Latro, something along the lines of, uh, they're talking, you know, the philosophers say there's only one God, but you obviously, you see them and there's many. And, and somebody, I think, uh, somebody says, well, think about it this way. If you're a beggar and you go to a castle, you never really meet the king, but the, the cook who gives you leftovers for a meal and the stable hand who lets you sleep on dry straw and warmth. Like, they're not the king, but they're kingly to you. This kind of idea of, you know, that in the, in the great chain of being, if I can be that presumptuous, if you will, the, the lesser spirits, some of them, obviously, they serve. And if you don't know any better, if you haven't received revelation or haven't had the ability to work it out for yourself, they would certainly seem uh, divine, even though in the strict sense they're not. And uh, I always, that passage, I read that book maybe for the first time in my, in my mid-20s, and that like slapped me across the face as just this fantastic passage that really put a lot of things into, um, into uh, perspective and also kind of really echoed some of the perspective you find among uh, the Inklings like Lewis or Tolkien and some of their uh, discussions that, on these things, on myth and, uh, and how myth can be useful but often can, be, uh, can also be abused to, to give men the wrong idea. And uh, I thought that was very powerful and uh, said, wow, uh, you know, and that was one of those moments where I, I don't know if I've understood everything in this book, but there are passages here that, that are amazing and speak to something much deeper and much more powerful than just, uh, you know, just the, 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 the daunting and slightly humorous story of a, Gre of a Roman soldier in Greece who can't remember what he does each day. Can you just give us an idea of Wolf's status in the the world of sci-fi or, or speculative fiction? Um, sure. I think that he is one of the he's one of the big names, um, especially among those who don't see genre as as a dirty word. You know, I mean, sometimes in broader literary quote unquote fiction, like oh, they write genre fiction. Which is one of the reasons that Le Guin would say something like Wolf is our Melville. This idea, like, you know, Melville writes about whale hunting and he has chapters on what that actually means. And, um, you know, my experience with Moby Dick is he makes those, even those things interesting. And he tells a deeper and broader story about the human condition uh, under what you, I mean, some people might want to dismiss as a weird whaling novel uh, about, about a crazy captain. And, and what Wolf does with the genre, which he's not embarrassed to be an SFF author, you know, that science fiction, fantasy, to some extent, horror, like these things are not bad things to him, but because of his skill and his imaginative work, he's able to elevate that. The same way, for example, that The Lord of the Rings, when it first came out, certainly in the United States, when it got official, you know, publication, you know, people would see it for more uh, than, than what it, than, you know, just a genre book, just a book about goblins and trolls and, and elves for, for, for teenagers or kids. Um, and we're able to draw out the bigger things. And, and Wolf has that effect on a number of authors, not all of who share his, you know, many of who don't share his religious vision, 
you know, but respect his literary talent, his imagination. Uh, Neil Gaiman, for example, is a big fan of, of Wolf and also a big fan of Chesterton. He certainly doesn't share their religious commitments, but he respects their style and the idea of the importance of imagination and what it can be used. Um, you know, he's used a couple of times, I think once or twice even as an epigraph for some of his uh, books aimed for children, Neil Gaiman, that it's, a, it's kind of a dog roll, but it tells a very Chesterton idea, even if Chesterton didn't use these exact words, that, you know, stories don't tell us that children, that dragons exist. They know dragons exist. Uh, stories tell them that dragons can be fought and killed. And, and this idea that uh, fiction, including, you know, genre fiction, speculative, or speculative fiction, if you want to call it that, but fantasy, science fiction, horror, um, you know, or, or, you know, you can find similar people say anything about mysteries, you know, the great, you know, Catholic convert, Father Monsignor Knox was a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes, for example. Um, you know, you have a number of important Christian authors in there, like Dorothy Sayers, who uh, said at some point, I think, I believe she said something along the lines of, like, it's the last moral fiction left because it believes there's evil and we have to, justice has to come, in some sense. That these authors who transcend genre. And so especially for those who, I think for tube fans, you know, for people who aren't embarrassed about liking the genre they like, but also appreciate fine literary style, they don't see those two things as contradictory, including a number of, of big name authors who are well liked as members of the the SFF community and, and by fans at large, uh, they pay large respect to Gene Wolfe because he does those things he takes. Uh, he takes the genre and he uses the tropes, but he, he does them in a way that evokes powerful emotions that can hide very deep meaning. The story that uh, when we first started talking about, the one that I mentioned that's online, um, Underhill, I think. Yeah, yeah um, I read that yesterday. That book, is, that story, I love that story so much because it's really a science fiction story, not a fantasy story. But the thing in it that is most like science fiction is actually more like treat it as more fantastical. And the actual science fiction is, all right, these medieval people, he needs to climb this giant mountain that you can't climb. How does he do it? And they use engineering. You know, he gets some, what would technically be the, you know, the kind of people who would be the medieval equivalent of engineers this night does and they work out how to do it very accurately than they could honestly have done in those days. And that's the real science fiction in the sense of, Science fiction as, as men with hammers and wrenches, you know, how do we use knowledge to solve a problem? And then the ultimate antagonist is kind of your obvious science fiction antagonist, but they're treated kind of like, almost like evil wizards. So what looks like a fantasy story is a science fiction story, but it's not science fiction in the way that it obviously seems to be science fiction. But in a much more deep down, all right, well, science fiction is about how do we use knowledge to solve problems? That's what the knight does with the help of, uh, you know, a bunch of, you know, uh, tinkerers or whatnot. And it's a fascinating, and it's also there as an echo too of, of Paul Anderson, his, his, one of his famous novels, The High Crusade, which is about a bunch of English knights going to join uh, King Richard in the crusade. And then an alien ship lands and is like, we're going to take over your planet. And the knights are like, we're knights and we're Christians and we're Englishmen. No, you're not. And they fight and they win because, you know, medievals aren't dumb you know, just because they don't have technology. And they put their trust in the right and God, and they're not stupid people. They think things through. And they end up in his in this end of this book, they take the spaceship, and they, their plan is to take it to Jerusalem, to take Jerusalem back, and they accidentally go to space. And the book ends with, well, they built an interstellar empire of uh, uh, basically an English, Christian, Catholic interstellar empire. And oh good, here are other travelers from Earth. We would love to get back in touch with them and link up our church with the, with the Roman church and stuff like that. But the funny thing about it, of course, is, and some people don't, you know, like it for that reason, but medievals weren't dumb. These are the people who created the university system as we know it. They're not, not having the technological vision is not the same thing as being foolish or, or unintelligent. You know, plenty of people have uh, have things that fit in their pocket that are more powerful than some of the earliest computers we use to like win wars and like break you know Nazi codes and stuff. But they're not necessarily smarter for that. They have access to things, but that doesn't necessarily it's how you use it. And I think Wolf does that very well, especially in in that story. But it's one of those things that you'll find in a lot of his work where he kind of goes back to medieval or mythic kind of times. You know, you see the same thing in the Soldier series with Latro okay, these people don't have the technology we have, but they're not stupid because of that. That's not about lacking uh, intelligence. It's about where knowledge can go based on what we do know and what we can 
do to gain more. What I enjoyed about that story is the, you know, you have this Christian English knight and uh, he has a relic of St. Joseph in the pommel of his sword. He's going to rescue this princess. At a certain point, you realize that she's Chinese, I think. And she is talking about all these Chinese deities and she's saying, you know, maybe you could, he's having trouble rescuing her. And she's saying, maybe you could, you know, pray to the queen of heaven and, you know, ask her husband her esteemed husband to help you. And he's like, oh yes, St. Joseph. So he goes and prays and fasts to St. Joseph. Uh, and, you know, obviously that's not who she, who she meant. Uh, but, uh, and then you get this scientist from the future in the end and uh, this kind of goblin of a guy. And, uh, and you know, that it turns out, you know, that the pagan and the Christian, both from the Middle Ages, have more in common <laughs> with each other than with this uh, this future scientist guy. Yeah. And he wants to solve his problem in a really horrendous way. And he gives them a device to do it. He says, it won't affect you, but your ancestors are down the line. And they're riding away. And they're like, this is horrendous. And they just, they throw it away. Right. They destroy exactly. it because we don't want that. But that's okay. We found each other. I saved the princess. We've fallen in love. We're going to get married and, and, and you know, live our lives. And, uh, and we can forget that. And that's why it's funny because it's this, this weird guy from the future. He's the most fantastic pass part of that. And he's basically treated like a fantasy villain. Like, here's the magic MacGuffin. Like, oh, you know, we have to destroy this. And that's treated less scientific than the very straight up engineering problem of how do I climb this mountain? Which is really at the core what makes it more of a sci-fi story than a fantasy story if you're willing to draw those genre distinctions. And they destroy the magic MacGuffin or the, you know, you know to use, um, I forget, it's not to Asimov, it's... Uh, Clark, you know, Clark wrote, you know, uh, highly advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It's the most magic device they have, but it's an evil device. So just like, you know, they throw it. And there's also that kind of kind of postmodern undercutting of that, too. Like in a fantasy story, that might be the entire quest. But in this, which is technically a sci fi story and it's just a gadget. Well, just throw it in the river. It'll <laughs> break, you know, yeah. and uh, because the real problem was how do I climb this mountain? And the real solution was well, let's figure out some angles and build a really big ladder, ultimately. And uh, it's beautiful. Right, um, right. Which St. Joseph reveals to him in a, in a dream. That's right. This device. You know, and how, you can play that as fantasy if you want, but of course to a Catholic, that's not... It's fantastical, but it's not fantasy in the sense of, you know, something that can't happen. It's magic. It's like saints do that. We have evidence of saints doing that in the lives of other saints. Why should I not believe that St. That Joseph helped him, the carpenter helped him out, and how to build the, the proper device. I'd like to return for a moment to this this idea of genre because it's interesting and I don't know when else I would get a chance to talk about it on the podcast. So tell me if you think I'm right about this. So genre is essentially any kind of what you would call genre fiction. It's it's literature that, a subsection of lit, literature that focuses on a, on a specific subject matter or a style or a, a series of tropes so you have detective novels, you have westerns, you have sci-fi, you have fantasy, you have different subsets of those things. I guess horror, what else? I'm not sure. But it's not the same as like comedy versus tragedy. Those, you know, those aren't genres exactly. So I guess the the reason why this might be looked down on by some other than a lot of genre fiction is not modern realism. And, and so, you know, the kind of people who deny the supernatural or whatever tend to frown on it is that there's the, there's always the danger artistically that people are just going to read it because they like space. Shit. It's like, I'm going to see whatever star Wars movie comes out because I like ATSTs and it doesn't matter that much how good the movie is because I'm just excited to see an ATSD on the screen. So I guess that that's that might be the danger. It's like, you know, I like paintings of big, you know, 18th century French battles, and I'm not really that interested in the composition or anything like that. But just like if I see it, it, it sets me off. So I guess I guess that's like part of the legitimate uh, sort of like concern towards genre that that some people have. Or, or one of the possible pitfalls, but at the same time, it doesn't make sense to reject something simply because it, you know, shares in a certain tradition or uses certain subject matter that happens to be interesting in itself, as well as how it's used in a literary context. Do, do you think that I'm sort of in the right ballpark there? I think that's true. I, I, have a, I have a friend who says that genre basically boils down to marketing. You know, when you read an author, you might like the author, and you might not care. There are authors who cross genres, but like you're writing a story with spaceships, it makes sense to 
to market that story to people who like spaceships. And I've made, I've argued the point sometimes that like drawing a distinction, speculative fiction, I think is good. I mean, I would say that science fiction and fantasy are all just fantasy in some respects. And um, I've made the argument that, well, like what's in some ways a big sci-fi genre uh, or subgenre, cyberpunk, right? Where you put your mind in a machine. Well, to a materialist or a Cartesian dualist, that makes perfect sense. That's related to the facts of the world. Yeah, we could do that with technology one day. To an Aristotelian or a Thomist, that's fantasy. It's made up. You're imagining a different metaphysical world. That's not how reality works. So the ultimate, for, for people who don't know what cyberpunk is, I guess the Matrix would be a pretty good example of sure, that. Sure, the Matrix is a great example. Johnny Mnemonic, if uh, you want an older Keanu Reeves movie. Um, <laughs> the, if you want books, the works of, of William Gibson, are, uh, right, especially his earlier works, are very much. And I like cyberpunk a lot. Uh, Ghost in a Shell, if uh, you're interested. I just in, rewatched the movie last week. <laughs> yeah. And, and cyberpunk can do a lot of things. There's an interesting part in uh, the beginning of the, of the original Ghost in the Shell movie where you're seeing the Major's body created and then she wakes up and she looks at her hand and there's a question of identity and stuff like that that can be very deep. But on the other hand, you know, the idea that like, um, and, and, and strictly speaking, the Major is, is basically a living human brain in an mm -hmm. entirely prosthetic yes, body. Yes, yes, yes. But the, the kind of thing where these kings can go at some points for like, oh, well, you've transferred your mind to another body and it's still you, you know, that kind of very kind of modern Cartesian, the soul and the body are different or kind of an almost verging on materialism take on like Locke, who thought that personhood was continuity of personality rather than something related to our being, which is which is certainly what Aristotle would think, what St. Thomas would think. Uh, and, and arguably, not even arguably, uh, there's a dogmatic definition that the soul is the form of the body is the belief of the, of the church as well. And so like genre, ultimately, I think that my friend is correct that genre is a marketing thing. Like I want to tell, you know, I want to tell a great epic, but I want to tell it in the future. Uh, I, I, like Frank Herbert's Dune, this great epic of empires and ecology and what it means to be human versus a machine that can mimic our thinking, which is in the background of these things, you know, he wants to tell that story. He wants to bring in the importance of, of religion without kind of taking any modern things. So throw it a couple millennia in the future. These things have evolved, but you can still see the parts if you're if you're if you know enough about them. And and let's play this out. And uh, Frank Herbert isn't less of an extremely skilled author at dealing with these things because he decided to work with you know psychics and um, and uh, biotechnology and spaceships. In some ways, one could argue that working within those, here's a very Chestertonian point, constraints are for creativity. You, uh, you know, just like Chester talks about the law as a fence, like, don't go past this because you'll fall down a cliff. Ja constraints of, of genre or of uh, technique and all that are to help with creativity. Sir Weiss Pinkhair is the great uh, Dominican moral theologian of the modern age in his work on virtue. He talks about um, uh, different kinds of excellence and one of the and freedoms. One of the things he talks about is, is freedom of excellence is, is really what virtue is about. If you want to be good at an instrument or a sport, you've got to learn by learning the fundamentals. And these are boring at some points and they constrain you. But once you can work well within those constraints, right, you can play and even create great pieces of music. You can, uh, you can pull off that, that hat trick or that triple play or whatever, you know, pick your sport analogy, great thing, the Hail Mary pass. You can do those things because having mastered the skills that are constrained by the rules, you now have a place to move in them in ways uh, that are creative and liberating in many respects. And so the idea that like that genre is bad is is either a failure to see how constraints can aid creativity, or as you said, uh, especially when it comes to science fiction, fantasy, horror, it's like oh well, those deal those deal with and. People call it escapism, as Tolkien said once in one of his letters, I think. He's like, why well, wouldn't prefer the kind of fiction they prefer? And they should ask themselves, if this literature is escapist, why do you want to escape? Isn't that usually what a prisoner wants, right. not a right. not right. a free man? Yeah, you know, arguably in the grand historical scheme of things, realism is genre, right? Because it's just not the norm for human storytelling, Historically, it's a relatively new thing, and this is something I've kind of had hammered into me reading people like, uh, you know, Tom Shippey, the great Tolkien scholar, or just in my study of Tolkien, because he's the, the author that I've read most commentary on, that's 
really come home to me is that realism is kind of an anomaly. And it's not that there's something wrong with Jane Austen. I love Jane Austen, but it's as much of a kind of constraint as anything else, I guess you could say. Sure. And I think Austen is a great example there because the constraints of her very realist fiction are the constraints not only of, of the social class of, of Edwardian England, but also the moral constraints of, you know, of a Christian, what is still a Christian civilization. And her stories play out with the importance of those things as very real and interacting in the life of, of her characters. And the way faith plays out in, say, Tolkien or Wolf, it's not always right there in your face, but yet you can read plenty of Austen scholarship that talks about the importance of that, the importance of her as the daughter of a, I believe her father was a, was a pastor or whatever in the Church of England, the importance of that playing out in her characters. And having to, over, like, you know, Pride and Prejudice tells you exactly what it's about ultimately. One of these people has to overcome their pride, the other has to overcome their prejudice so that they can really see each other for what they are and their love can be something more than just, uh, than just uh, attraction or as an other, you know, a fatal attraction that doesn't have a firm founding like the one sister or a desire for security that doesn't have any kind of mutuality as in her one friend, you know, but she gets the good marriage and it's not the good marriage first and foremost, because she married a wealthy man, it's a good marriage because they respect each other and see each other's strong virtues and have also helped each other overcome their failings to be able to be who they are. I think that's an important, that realism also has its constraints if we want to be true to who human beings are. I'm not sure that modern realism, quote unquote, does all that all that well, but, uh, all, but uh, we can right. all be Jane Austen. So for some personal recollections of Jean Wolfe, I have with me Sandra Meisel. She is an historian and also a well-known sci-fi critic and had a great deal of involvement with the sci-fi world. And she personally knew Jean Wolfe as well as a number of other great sci-fi authors. Sandra, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm glad we got it set up. I would love to just get some background first on your involvement with the world of science fiction, how, how that came about, and what's the nature of your involvement. Yes. Well, I started reading science fiction when I was 11 years old, and the first thing I started, oddly enough, was a Catholic science, well, set in a Catholic universe, Case of Conscience by James Blish. I was a rather precocious reader, of course, and after... Coming out of graduate school, my husband and I, my husband was a chemist we met at University of Illinois, we discovered through the science fiction magazines that there was a thing called science fiction fandom, which had conventions. And in 1967, we went to our first convention at Midwest Con, which was uh, held in the Cincinnati area, and met some of the wise old fans. Uh, science fiction fans often graduate to be writers. Lots of writers that you will have heard of uh, were fans. Even such people as Robert Block, the author of Psycho, Harlan Ellison, who should need no introduction. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I, I, was very I was very friendly with Harlan. It's not a problem. And we started <laughs> going to, to conventions. And I started corresponding with people that I met. And at the Marcon convention, that's March in, in 1970, we met Jean Wolfe in Columbus, Ohio, at this small convention. And it was a rather beleaguered convention because it was sharing the hotel with the high school basketball fans of the state of Ohio who were there for the state championship. And you know, struck up an acquaintance with Jean. He was uh, very approachable. And the thing about Gene, to look at him, and you can, and listeners can look him up on Wikipedia and you'll see the picture that I'm talking about. He looked in his later years like an amiable walrus. He was not a colorful 
person. He was not exotic in any way, shape, or form. He was a nice guy from the Midwest who wrote for this uh, trade magazine and was beginning to make a mark in science fiction. Well, over the years, I had already read some of his books uh, by that time. I had read, I started, the first one in 1967 was a short story called Trip Trap, which is basically a riff on the fairy tale of the troll under the bridge. And then I had read his early novel, Peace, a few years later. And as we became friends, we wound up uh, corresponding. We'd have dinners at conventions. He and his wife, Rosemary, were guests at our home. I went to museums with them. I attended mass at his parish in Barrington, Illinois. And it was very nice. He was, despite his bland and you looking rather conventional, the man did not have a conventional mind, not in the least. We would argue over such things as the real existence of St. Catherine of Alexandria, who is a, a, used as an illusion in his books of the new sun. And I said, no, she, she's a legendary character. No, no, there's a picture of her in a medieval manuscript, and therefore she's real, because they wouldn't put anything in the book that wasn't real. This man could find ideas for stories in the simple thing like, what if a car could get pregnant? <laughs> and even though he was educated as an engineer, he was very widely read. He had a wonderful gift for language. He had a fabulous vocabulary. And instead of inventing a language or inventing terms like most science fiction writers will do, he would use unusual English or foreign words. For instance, instead of a water lily in his world, it's a nenophar, which happens to be the uh, proper scientific name of water lily. His hero, Severian, wears a coat of fulgen, which is a word for deepest black. The Severian carries things not in a satchel, but in a sabotage. He used a lot of Greek and Roman uh, associations. He also used German and Spanish and French. So say the man was really very widely read, very versed in mythology. And one of the odd words he used was the name of the capital of the city, of the, of the empire that Severian is involved in, which is called Thrax, T-H-R-A-X. Well, in Latin, Thrax is the hilt of a sword. It also means something else, which we will not mention on Catholic TV. So, of course, I had to get him a bronze coin of Max Thrax, a late Roman emperor. Uh, Jean had a very peculiar sense of humor, as I mentioned, the pregnant car. Well, he never admitted this, but I think it can't be anything else. But he wrote me briefly into the Citadel of the, Arta of the Autark, which is uh, the last book of the Book of the New Sun. There's a brief mention of a temple of a goddess the black warrior made precious helper of men. Well, that is the symbolic translation of my full name, Sandra Louise Antonia Schwartz. Whereas Gene ah. Wolf, of course, was the well-born wolf. And he liked word games like that. How long had he been a Catholic when you met him? I would think for quite a while because he converted when he married Rosemary and they were middle-aged or something. He was very devoted to her, wasn't he? Oh, absolutely. They they were a model couple. He was so he was so protective of her. And, you know, you have the idea of the hard drinking, wenching writer, not Gene Wolfe. No, 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 no. He was a perfect gentleman and absolute straight arrow. And yet he could be friends with people who weren't. Um, he yes, was a virtue in itself. He was, he was very uh, broad in his associations. I'm not going to name any names, but I can think of somebody he counted as a friend that I would not have gotten in the same room with. What was your impression of him as a Catholic and how he, how he approached his faith? Was there anything distinctive about it? Well, uh, having been to Mass with him, I'd say he was certainly orthodox, devout. He, he has told reviewers from time to time, yes, I am a serious Catholic. And I read my way into the church. It didn't. Ju he didn't just convert for the sake of marrying Rosemary. He really thought it through, and he was he was committed. Catholics in the world of science fiction were thin on the ground back then, when I was active in the 20th century, and now I think they're extremely thin. The only ones that I can think of would be Tim Powers, Dean Koontz, 
Patricia Briggs, and there are none of the major presently award-winning writers are Catholic, to my knowledge. And I did know so, everybody yeah, in the field So yeah, let's go ahead and talk about the Book of the time. New Sun. This is, you know, generally considered to be kind of his most impactful or his, his magnum opus. Like The Lord of the Rings, it is a single novel in multiple volumes, I think it's fair to say. So it's four volumes, and then there's, I don't know what you call it, a coda? Yeah, a coda he, he volume. He calls it which, a coda, published, yeah. like, put sequel to The Book of the New Sun. But right. I'm really sure that Wolf always said it was a coda. There's so a, I haven't read it, but I guess it, it makes the events of the it, initial novel more it clear. It's about the coming of, yeah, well, there are random moments where Severian will just drop revelations that not only would a lot of people not figured out, but one or two of them would have been nigh impossible, not because the evidence wasn't there, but nothing would spark you to like, oh, that's why. You'd have to be like really doing a deep reading. But but no, I always compare it to, this isn't a perfect comparison in any means for but Wolf has said a couple of times, Severian's not a Christ figure. Like he's not Aslan, certainly, um, you know, Christ in another way. He's really more of a Christian figure. And uh, insofar as this is true, even his struggles with, uh, with uh, his desire uh, for women in some respects, I think it echoes Augustine in the Confessions. Now, you know, Augustine having revelation there for him and a mother who was there with him and stuff. He comes to a much more definitive conclusion in that way than in the dying earth of the Book of the New Sun, where these things survive only in certain kind of hints in various civil and semi-religious functions. Um, and I would compare Earth of the New Sun, which is also told from Severian's perspective. He basically goes, hi, I'm on this ship now going to do the thing that I left to do at the end of the thing. I just uh, went out to the deck and I tossed into the time stream in a leaden box the manuscript of the Book of the New Sun, which is bears the conceit that Wolf has that I discovered this future manuscript. Sure. In much the like talking. Yeah. You know, and now I'm writing this. It's almost like Augustine's retractations, not really taking anything back, but clarifying and uh, admitting more and sometimes clearing up puzzles that have come across. It's not, that's not, that is even less of a perfect thing than, than New Sun as confessions in some ways, but they're kind of the mode I've been thinking about. Like I just reread New Sun and I'm going through Earth again. Let me read that, uh, if you don't mind, let me read that quote from Wolf uh, about Severian, and then we can jump into a discussion of like what the, the Book of the New Sun is actually about. So he says, I don't think of Severian as being a Christ figure. I think of Severian as being a Christian figure. He is a man who has been born into a very perverse background who is gradually trying to become better. I think that all of us have somewhere in us an instinct to try and become better. Some of us defeat it thoroughly. We kill that part of ourselves just as we kill the child in ourselves. It is very closely related to the child in us. And I think that's I think that's that's true. This kind of idea that there is we could argue what this means, but I won't go into the modern theology woods of the de definition. But there is, as plenty of people will admit, there is you know including Saint Thomas Aquinas that there is a natural desire for God, that our intellects seek perfect truth and our wills seek perfect good. And there's a very kind of the Augustinian point, that beautiful line from the Confessions, where he's speaking right in the midst of his own kind of burning and his trouble, his desires and his, the bending of his will and all these things. And he says, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee. This idea that really the only thing that fully satisfies the human will is God. And so there is this thing, and I do think a lot of people, a lot of people kill it. So in my experience, just to not be too autobiographical, but during college, I kind of drifted away from the church. I mean, I told you I was a Catholic, but I was a bad Catholic. I didn't really practice. I went to Mass when I went home, because that's what you do. And then I went to a Catholic college that had uh, the great philosophy and theology people, very faithful to the church. They ultimately helped me come back. Um, but kind of in the beginning, like, I can do what I want. And I was very technologically oriented. My first major was, was computer science. I wanted to, you know, get rich right before the tech bubble burst in the early 2000s, and then none of us realized we were going to get rich. That was that time had passed. But... I remember waking up in the middle of the night sometimes and feeling empty and going like, well, why? I should be happy. I'm doing all this stuff that the world says makes me happy. Why am I not happy? And, and I think there was something. I really do think that, for example, my love of fantasy and imagination and science fiction has that. You know, I remember the, the great uh, late Terry Pratchett, who was certainly not a, a religious man, um, nonetheless had a wonderful line in, uh, in one of his... Uh, Discworld books where he says humans need fantasy to be human 
to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape, which from a materialist and atheist, that's a pretty good description of man as that kind of place where spirit and matter meet in some respects. And that our ability to, to fantasize, our ability to take the experience we have and recreate it fantastically to entertain ourselves, to uh, make other things to, to draw out in ways, uh, points that maybe we couldn't, aren't, aren't able to make by arguing, but we can make through letting people have a secondary experience of it is a very, is a very powerful thing. And I really do think that kind of childlike thing is important. And I think that's what makes very much Severian, that kind of Christian figure, and only a Christ figure as far as every Christian is seeking to be a Christ figure to, as John the Baptist says, to, to decrease so he might increase so that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us, as St. Paul says. Um, and you see that in Severian, and he talks about that in the way that, um, you know, again, he's narrating it, so, you know, there's always, we can play the irreliable narrator game, but that he seems to have this desire for those things more than uh, the other apprentices do. So let's uh, step back and actually just sort of say what this book is about. So it's it's set in, you know, the distant future when the Earth's sun is cooling, Society has kind of reverted to a, maybe a quasi-medieval state, but with remnants of old technology. But the line between magic and technology is kind of blurred. Uh, you got some alien stuff going on. I've only read it once, so I can't really be too specific about <laughs> the nature of it. So, you know, uh, the main character is this guy, Severian. And Wolf said that he has been born into a very perverse background, uh, which seems accurate. What, what kind of background is Severian born into, Father Brennan? Well, Severian, so one of the ways, so kind of a remnant, kind of a medieval comeback in the society, certainly in the, in the capital city of Nessus, where Severian grows up, is that there are guilds, and these guilds have quasi-religious things. They have patron saints. The, the guild, and Severian is born into the Guild of the Seekers of Truth and Penitence, which sounds wonderful, but they're commonly called the torturers because they're basically the headsmen for, for the empire. And so when somebody needs to be tortured for information or executed, the torturers do that. The torturers are the jailers, at least in, in Nessus. And also in certain parts of the other country where torture journeymen go out and journey and, and ply their trade. And so Severian is just as sometimes monasteries in the Middle Ages would, you know, children and families can support or ever be left there to be educated and raised and become part of the monastery. The torturers get new members by people either leave their children with the torturers or if a pregnant woman comes in to be tortured and executed, the torturers get the child. Severian, uh, as far as we know, was born of a woman sent to the torturers to be jailed, to be punished, and I think, and ultimately executed. And so he's born right into this and he grows up thinking it's, it's normal to do what they do. And the perversity there really is, and he'll say this at the end of the book when he comes back uh, to Nessus as the, the ruler, um, that's kind of the whole book, and he tells you that right in the beginning, so it's not really a spoiler, that this is his story from being a torturer's apprentice to being the autarch, the emperor, the ruler of the commonwealth. And uh, he comes back, and he says that a lot of people like who are poor and hungry will come to torturers and they'll tell, oh, I'm great, I torture rats, I torture dogs, and torturers won't take them, they have to raise them from a child because... As one of the masters says to him at the end of the book, well, bad men can't do this because bad men can't be just. And Severian's answer is, well, yes, master, but I don't think good men should do it. He, like, he was like, good men shouldn't do this. And he's like, well, we, bad men can't do it. And Severian's like, well, that's why I don't think people should, we should, maybe we shouldn't do it at all. That the perversity of it is that for the, the especially the torture aspect of it, you know, certainly, you know, there is a, there is a, a we, the executioner and the jailer are not our favorite people. Um, but those things in their proper place can be, you know, justified. But the kind of torture that is described, the kind of torture the torturers do is, um, you know, is is pretty horrendous. And the idea is, well, good men have to do this. And they have to be raised in doing it to be good at it and moral um, in the sense that they cannot ever err either to mercy or justice. Their job is to carry out the sentence. And Right. No were, sadism, no mercy. Yeah. And if they were came in, they might either be too soft on people they like, or they might be the kind of people who just like hurting people. And so the idea is that it has to be good men. And the perversity of it is that it warps good men. It certainly warps Severian. I mean, we in all, in all his relationships, in some ways, um, are, are, especially his relationships with women, are very warped. And I don't think that it's overly psychological to say that Wolf's part of that is 
Wolf saying how this plays out. Men, good men can't do evil things and remain good men, untouched by them, uh, and remain, doesn't make them necessarily monsters, even though that's how the world views them, but and if they stick to their moral code, but nonetheless their moral code is going to be skewed. Their relationships with people are going to be skewed. And I think that's part of the reason why Severian's relationship with women are, is so obviously messed up in some ways, um, that he can't separate love in some ways from physicality and all those things. And part of that is, I think, the perversity of, of, his, of his being raised and, and the tragedy of it. The, the tortures by the end of the book are, are tragic because evil men can't do this. But in the end, what we've learned is that one of the things we've learned is that good men can't either. And, and that's the tragedy of it, that, that good men are being made to do that, and they shouldn't. And also, just even in the name, it's good to seek for truth and for penitence. Those are good things. Truth is good. Repentance is good. But what that boils down to is that the guild for the seekers of truth and penitence is the guild of torturers. And so that perverts the desire for, for truth, the desire for repentance, you know, ultimately the desire for, for justice, something greater uh, as an ideal rather than just the end of an equation, I think. So Severian does show mercy to someone, and for that he is kicked out, and he has to go, uh, he becomes a kind of itinerant headsman in various villages that need a criminal to be executed. He does his job, he does it, you know, artistically and with discipline, and he uh, somehow comes into the possession of the, an ancient relic of a religious figure lost in the mists of time known as the conciliator, who I think it's pretty clear is supposed to be Jesus, but, you know, in the book, nobody, well, maybe I'm wrong, but in the book, nobody really remembers that much about him. So he, he comes across this relic and it, it, he just starts inadvertently healing people and things when he brings it near them. And so he's trying to figure that out. And and then the next, you know, like three books, I, I'm not sure that I can even explain what happens, but he just has sort of various episodic experiences, which eventually lead him to a kind of ascent in power and and also kind of a moral ascent, I suppose. His journey is, I think there's shades of Dante there in that he has to journey into darkness to then climb out again. So one of the kind of key things I think of sacramentality in the books and and I guess I'll give a spoiler warning here because it has to go into certain things that if you haven't read the book of the new sun, you might want to like pause this here and go read it over the next course of however many days and then come back. So you're not ruined. Um, it's worth, it's worth rereading numerous times. So knowing it doesn't hurt it, but I think it kind of may, might hurt. I'm glad I didn't know it when I read it the first time. So there's a rebel Vodalus who's rebelling against the autarky. And because he blames the autarky for man, no longer sailing the, the stars. Now, as it'll play out, there's a bit of a silent planet, C.S. Lewis space trilogy here, that the aliens, who in some respects, you know, are, are sci-fi angels, certainly they're, they're more evolved, not just in a kind of a, it's not just in a materialistic way, but like in a, you know, they have more knowledge of things, you know, and they can work with time, they're higher level beings in that kind of weird respect. And, and there's kind of a, it's kind of a sci-fi way of sticking angels in, which I mean is interesting enough with parallels between alien encounters and angelic and demonic encounters, but that's beyond the scope of this. But so he, he meets Vodalus in the graveyard at night. Vodalus is stealing corpses. And because the woman with Vodalus reminds him of another woman who's very important to him, which we'll later find out they're related, he kills a man who's trying to keep Vodalus from desecrating his grave so Vodalus could, could go. Vodalus gives him a coin that marks him out as, as a follower of Vodalus. And this is where you get this fascinating, really kind of sacramental vision. There's a great Oh, line. yeah, read it. I was about to read that, so you, you can There's read the that There's a great passage. line. We believe Chesterton. That, <laughs> we believe that we invent symbols. The truth is that they invent us. We are their creatures shaped by their hard, defining edges. And that's something very, like the Augustinian kind of definition of sacrament is a sign that makes present what it symbolizes. And Severian is reaching for that in a sense. Like, this symbol, this coin, makes me a follower of Vodalus. This is, of course, interesting because the coin is also used, like, I think it's Tertullian who compares baptism to receiving the coin. When a, when, a, when a new recruit joins the legion, they get the coin with the emperor's vision, and it doesn't matter if they don't have any training yet, now you're a member of the army because you've accepted the coin with the emperor's face. And he talks out to, like, the mark of baptism, right? Now we have been restored the image of the creator marked on our souls 
how, if, if that's how a, a soldier is with like a physical coin, how much more are we marked with baptism, that kind of that coin with the emperor, or the true king's face marked on our souls, restoring to us the fullness of the image and likeness of God. And so there's something to that. And again, here's a little bit of a spoiler, but we'll go into details. Over the course of the book at the end, we learn that that coin is a false coin. But also we learn that Vodalus is a false king. Like Vodalus is actually in, 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 uh, in line with evil forces and his uh, presumption to take back this age of lost technology is one that goes against powers of the heavens, both in the literal sense that they're from space and time, but also in a kind of a sense, also in a sense of, of, of missions, uh, people who serve in a mission of divine work. That's why, for example, when he see, he will see in a book, and actually at this point uh, bleed from his forehead, you know, he sees an angel basically, and you'll meet that angel in really literally meet that angel in, in Earth of in Earth of the New Sun. And, uh, you know, and it echoes some one of the brown, uh, Severian has a book of fantastical stories that also have moral and theological and philosophical points. And then one of those stories, an angel talks to a, a, a creature and says, I seem so much higher above you, like I know everything, but, you know, the, in, the increate, the pan creator, you know, all the, all the different words they use for God, the one who creates everything, the one who creates us and yet is within us. He is infinite, and so I'm closer to you than I am to him in some respects, um, in the in the great chain of being kind of thing, and that kind of plays out very much with these aliens later on, and, and hints of that in the book of the New Sun, and hints of man being stuck on Earth as a punishment for hubris, you know, which goes very well. Like I said, the silent Earth is a silent planet. C.S. Lewis's space trilogy, because our angelic intelligence is is the fallen one, and led, which led us to fall. Um, and so we are quarantined to a certain respect from the rest of, of the galaxy and the rest of creation. But this false coin is funny because in coming along with this, Vodalus proves a false master and Severian ends up serving the correct master almost by accident. And there's a level there too with a false Eucharist and a true Eucharist. There's an alien beast, again, I don't know how much to explain, but the alien beast, the Alzebo, is an alien creature brought to Earth. It hunts by, it, it hunts by, once it eats something, it can absorb their memories from their brain and then can play back their voices and their memories. And so it kills one member of family and then it tries to trick all the other members like, I'm your daughter out here and I'm lost, come get me, you know? And you go, Where, oh my God, where's my daughter? I thought she was, and then it eats you too. And then it uses you to get your friends or whatever. But there's a way to take from the owl's bone, create like a, an analeptic, a, a, a drug that will allow you to take memories from the dead. That's why Vodalus robs graves, and it's ostensibly to keep a lot, uh, keep a, uh, for Kronos forgetting what we know about technology. But Severian, it's when he does it, it's very much this kind of false Eucharist, right? In the Eucharist, right? Even the consumption of the Eucharist, that, like when the priest takes the Eucharist, especially because the priest always has to consume both species. The, pe the priest consumes the host, and then he consumes the precious blood, right? In this, you take the analeptic first, and then you eat the person. Basically, they're cooked, and you eat them. And in the Eucharist, we become what we receive. That's a very Augustinian idea, you know. Take, consume what you believe, become what you are. Like, because the Eucharist makes us the church, the mystical body of Christ. Well, in this perverted Eucharist, you know, seen even in that backwardness of cup first, then, then meat, if you will. You don't become them. You make them part of you. You absorb their memories. And it's like this perversion of the Eucharist to, to take the dead. But later when we find out uh, the stealing from the dead, this perversion. Later when we find out how one succeeds the autarky and how one gets the necessary knowledge to do what one must do to try to, to govern the commonwealth and ultimately try to bring the new sun, right? And they are both as a kind of an eschatological figure, but also quite literally a new sun so that earth doesn't die. A similar ritual is performed, but that is a ritual that, that needs life, not death, and requires the free, the victim, quote unquote, like, you know, obviously a parallel here to the Eucharist and the cross, to give himself freely so that the other person can eat and then join this communion of, of others who will then give what, allow one to do what one needs to do. And, and so this, like Vodalus is a false master and gives you a false Eucharist. And ultimately, when Severian finds his true, the, the true master, if you will, or at least the representative of that, there's a much truer kind of Eucharist. Symbolically, I mean, you know, we can argue about obviously the details and the morality of if it were a real thing, uh, it were sticky because, but, uh, but symbolically, I think that works very well. 
and it kind of goes with Severian's whole growth from that being kind of this major event in his life after he leaves Nessus, kind of one of the big major things right away in the beginning of the second book where he's left, finally left the city and is on his way to his new job. This is like one of the major events there. And then the other, the parallel that is true is the one of the last major events that leads him on that final part of his journey. Um, and I think that's very intentional. I, I think it's very true. And so his journey is uh, through like something hellish, really, through something, a perversion of the holy to something that is, you know, uh, glorious in, in some respects because it is a, a symbolic embodiment of the holy. Doesn't make Severian a perfect person, but who of us is, you know, read the saints and feel like a wreck because they're like, oh, I have an imperfection. And you're like, I can't overcome all my venial sins, but okay. Or, you know, even, you know, for some of us, I can't, I still struggle, you know, still struggling even, you know, depending on where we are on our journey, struggling with our mortal sins, you know, but that's part of what holy, you know, holiness is not about necessarily, I mean, it's ultimately about perfection, obviously, but in the here and now, it's about continuing to grow and undergo that transformation. And I think Severian does that. And those are some major points. And in fact, Severian's love is what lets that first one be something very different for him than it is for everybody else. And while it stays with him forever um, and, and ultimately helps make him a better man, and as we see the memories he absorbs also helps the person he loved who he now shares, who has, whose memories he has, also helps them in some respect be better, you know, if you will. Almost a purgatorial feature there of Severian's sacrifices help this person who he loved, who obviously wasn't as perfect as he thought she was. He had, using her knowledge helps, in a certain sense, pay away their sins. And there's a great line in Earth where he says about her, her he says, she wasn't a good woman, and somebody goes, what do you mean? And he goes, by her own standards. And he's like, and I know this because, you know, of, of this ex past experience. But nonetheless, she would desire me to go through with this trial and do the right thing. Because her desire was to be better than herself. And her desire was because she loved me to make me better. And my desire is to make her better because I loved her too. So since we're together in this way now, we will both be better by doing this. Jean was very interested in my activities as a costumer because besides writing, I started out writing for fanzines. Uh, the people I wrote about recommended me for pro work. I wrote, oh, maybe 45 professionally published articles about science fiction. I published two novels, three short, six short stories, a couple of chat books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I've subsequently have moved uh, much more into Catholic science fiction. The only thing I do with science fiction now is um, correspond with my few living friends in the field. Most of my old friends are dead, unfortunately. And I am sometimes consulted for information. I did a little bit of editing on the reissue of a book that I had edited 20 years ago, recently, things like that. But mostly insofar as I write, I write to the Catholic press. Uh, mostly for, at this time, Catholic World Report. But I was a costumer. I was a master costumer. Now, this is not cosplay as they do at the uh, comics cons and things like this. The World Science Fiction Convention, which was the most important event of the Fanish year, had a masquerade contest. And I won that three times. And that made me a master costumer. Well, Gene says in... This little book explaining his world, The Castle of the Otter, that he thought my Queen of Air and Darkness costume was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. And he was greatly gratified that my children enacted a little skit at a regional convention of Severian beheading a client and pulling out a pumpkin head instead of a human head. <laughs> so I got to make Severian's Fulgen cloak. And also the sword, a Severian has a very large sword called Terminus X, which I made out of cardboard and a curtain rod, and then carefully lettered its name Terminus X upon it. 
if I can just say something, I, I read an interview with him where he said that he actually got not only did you make that costume after the fact, but he got the idea for Severian's appearance from you or or inspired by a panel discussion you were involved with. Can oh, you yes. Tell us he, about went, that uh, he says in The Castle of the Otter that he went to a panel at a science fiction convention about how you make and design costumes. And he thought that he should give his hero something vivid that could be eventually turned into a costume and put it on the stage. And nobody had done it by the time I did it in the 1980s. He said he found himself somewhat disappointed that nobody had ever uh, done a costume of one of his characters. And then he kind of started thinking about it and, and realized none of my characters are actually that doable. So I need to write somebody who who could have a really simple you know, and iconic looking costume that somebody could do cheap. So he started thinking about the garb of a, an executioner. Yes, he did. And so I made a black cloak with a hood so it hit her head. I didn't make a mask for her. Uh, Severian's supposed to wear a mask. And uh, boots and the huge sword. I mean, it's it's like four feet long and with its, with its name carefully lettered on the blade. I did a number. Uh, I'm, I got to be very good at making weapons out of curtain rods and cardboard. Made a lot of them over my time. So uh, let's talk about Gene Wolfe's Catholicism. Uh, Gene was a devout Catholic. Uh, the The Catholic aspects of his writing are, are rather subliminal, but they're there because the idea of the Christian making his way through life is the pattern of Severian, a torturer who becomes a savior. And since Christ was a carpenter who was crucified on the product of a carpenter's labor, what if we have a torturer who becomes the savior instead of the tortured becoming the savior? There are so many levels to his books. They're, they're so lush in language and imagination, characterizations, all the the, the fine literary qualities. He's very popular in, within the field for his fine literary qualities and much praise. But he had the habit of getting to the end. You get to the end of the book, and essentially he says, well, the solution and the climax is left to the clever reader, who can obviously figure it out. Well, not always, because they're very recondite books. And I found it occasionally frustrating. If you want to dip into Gene Wolfe, I would suggest trying any of his many short story collections that's what my my other interviewee said, uh, the best of Gene Wolfe, which I've read about half of. And yes, it's much more accessible than the Book of the New Soul. Yes, and then, then you get in touch with the kind of mind you're dealing with. Was he esoteric as a person in, in talking to him as you know some of his stories could no, be? No, or... it's, more, it's more that he knew so much. You also have to understand that science fiction fans do not talk like other people. And in my old age, I am rather lonely because nobody speaks my language except my own children and one or two <laughs> living friends. Well, we have broad mental horizons, possibly shallow, but very broad. So if you sit down for breakfast with Gene Wolf, you may find yourself uh, talking about Tudor history or the mythology of the Caucasus in, in Europe, uh, anything. But his manner was entirely a sober, normal, Midwestern, middle-class guy. And the contrast is, was part of the fun of, of knowing him. I almost co-edited uh, an anthology of fantasy stories about griffins with him, but it unfortunately it fell through. I did get to anthologize him once in uh, an anthology of writers influenced by Kipling that I did with David Drake called Heads to the Storm. And at least in that degree, I was I was able to work with Sheen. The impression I get of him is being, you know, unassuming, gentle, uh, generous with his time, it seems. And he always had kept his number in the yellow pages. People could easily write or call so him. People, uh, but he didn't like to be called. He liked to call you. It was very odd. He didn't really like to talk on the telephone. So you might have had trouble doing a podcast with him. The association with the Book of the New Sun is such that when my children were still at home, I used to bake a lamb-shaped cake every Easter. I'm sure you've seen those. It's, it's, yes, my mother did uh, the same, yeah. Well, it was ceremonial in our family that I would say to the cake, 
think of the new sun, Lammy, and then I would behead him with a sharp knife. And we would lay the head aside. Why do you think that Wolf uses so many, uh, particularly in this work, so many subtle illusions and and uh, um, esoteric elements that are so difficult to decipher? I mean, it, certainly he, he has no obligation to hold us by the hand with everything. Um, let me let me give an example. Actually, just uh, a, a passage, short passage earlier in the book. And this is not necessarily a major thing, but he does this a lot. Our necropolis is said to be the oldest in Nessus. That is certainly false. But the very existence of the error testifies to a real antiquity. Though the autarchs were not buried there, even when the citadel was their stronghold, and the great families, then as now, preferred to inter their long-limbed dead in vaults on their own estates. So he's kind of throwing this stuff at you, and, and he makes, makes this reference to long-limbed dead. And you're like, oh, why are they long limbed? What, what does that mean? You know, are they normal people? What's what's going on here? You know, why do you think he he takes this approach with like these little micro things that you really have to look at to figure out? In some respects, I think it's a bit of world building. Like he tries to live to the, just like Tolkien did, you know, to the the conceit that this is a translation of a real book from a real future that not everything is going to make sense to us. He says explicitly at some point, like, I use archaic words to translate some of these things because, A, I'm trying to find the closest word to describe this thing that's kind of alien to us by, um, you know, millennia of evolution plus possible alien strains, but also because that's the best. You should be a little confused because this isn't our world, our time. It's our world far removed. It is in our time. It is in our yeah, There's a whole, like, Gene Wolf glossary yeah. online for this. Yeah. And, uh, but I also think, um, he, and some of it's just world building, you know, like who's, who's Elbereth in Lord of the Rings? Like, you know, we can pull now, uh, thanks to all the great work that Christopher Tolkien did, may he rest in peace. We have a lot of those other stories, but when you first read Lord of the Rings, you had to piece it together and some of that's just world building. Why would, you know, why would, you know, elves know who they're talking about when they talk about the star maiden and stuff, you know? But also I think it is, you know, one of the things that I think Wolf does, and he does it very intentionally, and it's one of the things that, that uh, Cecilia Michelle Lopez said in her paper, is there's almost a double kind of thing to this. He uses a lot of postmodern things, and that's for if modern readers who modern readers who love that stuff, they can go with it. Um, you know, and then he also finds ways of using the deeper versions of medieval allegory, like acrostic stuff and all that, references that bring illusions, like the, the clearest of that is that experience with the bush, which is never really on fire and God doesn't talk to him like he talks to Moses. And yet in the sunlight, the bush appears to be burning. Severian has this great understanding of God as the source of all being and then removes his shoes, which anybody who's read Exodus and ever heard it proclaimed knows, take off your shoes, this is holy ground. So part of that is to, I think, to speak to the audiences he knows he has, you know, the different audiences in ways that will work for them. But if you're not going to do the deep work, you don't know the liturgy, you don't know the scriptures, those illusions will go right over your head. But these other things don't. Um, and you can, you know, oh, well, why did he pick this crazy Greek word? And what does it mean? And, you know, and ooh, look at how he's, you know, I think he very much uses time, that kind of time dilation and aliens and, and, uh, and, and, and like quantum mechanic kind of stuff and cosmological kind of stuff. I think he uses it very much as a, scientific gloss on the chain of being but you can just like that as oh this is cool sci-fi you know ooh, time faster than light and possible futures etc um you know and and that's neat from that perspective but also the importance of the question of a predestination and free will and how those two things work in, in concert and how um you know and how sometimes it's hard to see uh to know until the end of things um this is a thing that that was mentioned in that article by Cecilia michel lopez the hour Bernard of Clairvaux and I read a review that like their view of history is you don't know its meaning till it's done. You know, its meaning isn't always obvious in it, but when it's done with and like you can then look at the scriptures, right? Like the historical books, obviously all the way that they point to Christ, both in the historical events themselves, like what God says, and also uh, the greater kind of typography. 
Um, this is very kind of a Cistercian, very kind of Augustinian view of history. Um, and I think there's, there's part of that is there too. Like you don't know until it's done. And those things are used to, on multiple levels, lead you to what you are, are able to see. So you can enjoy it as a kind of weird, fascinating dying earth story. And you can go back and admire, you know, his, his use of language and, and his use of, of, of high science concepts. And you can also go back a third or a fourth or a fifth time and then suddenly from new perspective, new learning, draw out the Christian meaning. I think that's part of it. He seeks to be a multivalent author. In the same letter that Tolkien says that he, the Lord of the Rings is, in, is a deeply Christian and Catholic work, especially in the revision, he also says, I started writing it because I wanted to take a, tell a really great tale. I just wanted to tell a good story. And I think that's part of it. I think Wolf uses the kind of postmodern, you know, unreliable narrator, various things. I think he uses those to speak to a modern audience and to draw them deeper and to make them interested in his tale and to allow them to get more out of it if they want to go back to it. Um, but he also uses it as a means of, I think, smuggling in his own kind of use of typology, if you, or if you will, or his own kind of use of of a deeper kind of medieval allegory that's something more than just this man is every man and now he meets virtue or whatever, not to, I mean, you know, not to, I don't want to say every man is bad or whatever, but like, obviously there's that, that's a very obvious allegory uh, written for a kind of a mass public, mass, a mass kind of thing, but you get the poems of Sinwolf or the work of Dante, where there's a deeper kind of allegory related to your own recollection of liturgical texts, of Bible verses, of you know, for the Anglo-Saxon scene, Wolf doing all the things that Anglo-Saxons love, acrostics and stuff hidden in the way he writes so that, oh, well, every first line spelt like, that's how he signed his, one of his poem, Christ Two is signed by him because there's his name. You know, if you line up the first lines, it says it's by him. Those kind of kind of deeper medieval uses of these things of, of allegorical allusions to liturgical text, to the lives of the saints, to the life of, uh, uh, to the, the scriptures. And I think that's part of it. He doesn't want to beat his audience over the head with any of that, even if it's there, um, because that would defeat the purpose, because they wouldn't enjoy the story they'd feel they were preached to, um, versus, you know, if they ever come around, uh, you know, there's all plenty of things to dig out, and if they ever do come around, if this does help them in some way, they can come back and dig it deeper, just as we who are Catholics who come to it, and we know he's Catholic and his faith mattered to him, we can begin to see those things on our second or third reading that others might not see till much later, but we, you know, because they're there, but they're not obvious. I think that's part of it. Sure. There's Byzantine stuff all over the play. I mean, Byzantine words, Byzantine yeah. names uh, for characters. And, and... and I think that is in some way, like one of the things you don't really realize till much later when they're fighting the Ashians. It's easy maybe if you catch certain things, but it's kind of obvious in the Ashian War. Like, they're not in North America. They're in South America. The Commonwealth is not what America became, the United States. It's what like Brazil became to a certain extent, and 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 the kind of a South American hedge kind of hegemony. You just wouldn't know because the sun is dying. Yeah, you know? <laughs> so it's much harder to see. And he makes allusions sometimes, like it gets it gets uh, it gets warmer as we go north. He says that somewhere I think early on, but it's easy to miss if you're not you know whatever paying close attention. And one of the reasons I think the kind of Byzantine Greek word you used is to a certain extent is. I don't know if this is true, but I think this might be one of it. Like, if he used Latin Latin words, we'd be like, "Oh, it's America. It's obviously America," because you know, um, you know, America Republic. Like, there's a deep kind of Roman kind of thing in the early American Republic. Like, you know, right under pen names of Cicero and stuff, and and like you know, the like you know Seneca and all those names. But so he uses Greek because it's not us. It's the other Roman Empire that we don't always think of as a Roman Empire because they spoke Greek. Yet they were still the Romanoi. Uh, in their minds and always were, you know, and so he uses Greek word like, yes, it is kind of like a Roman empire, but not the one you're thinking of. Right. I think he also likes to give his, based on his short stories as well, I think he likes to give his readers a puzzle to solve. I think that's true. I think that's part of how he tells tales, that a good tale will also have a good puzzle and you can appreciate it even if you're like scratching your head over the puzzle, but then that causes you to go back and if you get the puzzle, you feel like you've got the puzzle, it really, really improves. Sure. Yeah. There's one part in there that I don't think even I even got caught this, you know, when I read the book, but I read about it later, where he's in this ancient library and he comes across this ancient book and it's got a picture in it. And the way it's described is not something is not such that you would recognize what the picture is unless you took the trouble to really visualize it. 
um, because it's not described in familiar terms. But if you look at it, it's clearly the photograph of the moon landing. And but it's ancient at this point, which and, is and which is just cool. You it's know. really cool. And his cultural context is one that he describes it like, well, this is obviously armor. Maybe this is a conquering right, hero planting exactly. a flag for yeah. victory. And yes, but not the kind of victory you're thinking. And the, the enemy that that armor faces is not the enemy you're thinking of. And you read it, it sounds like a medieval painting of a of a great after of a great conquering hero. But it's actually it's it's the moon landing photograph. And I don't think I think I read the book three times and never caught that. And then I read something about the book and it was mentioned and I said no. And then I went back to the book and I'm like, oh yeah, that's what that is. And if you know, but it's it's just this painting that he passes. And it's even if you know he hides stuff, sometimes even on a reread where you're trying to be close, it's very easy to sometimes gloss over the bits that you're like, I get I think I get this. It's fine. He's looking at a painting of a soldier. Oops, my mistake. <laughs> There's something that the the reader who said I should interview uh, you wanted me to ask you about, and I've I've had a couple of friends who had this question, and I have, it's a question I have too, which is of Wolf's treatment, and I don't know if this is a feature of his work in general. I haven't encountered it so much in the short stories, but at least in the Book of the New Sun, his treatment of sexuality and the the description of women's bodies in some cases, you know, I wouldn't describe it as pornographic, but it's you know I would say uncomfortably detailed in some parts. So how do you, is this a problem for him as a Catholic author? Is this something that maybe he was trying to strike a certain balance and, you know, may or may not have gotten it perfectly? Or what do you think is is going on there? I think there is an attempt to strike a balance. I think part of this is when he talks about, you know, a man born in perverse circumstances and that kind of ending theme of even good men shouldn't do this, especially good men shouldn't do this. We shouldn't do it at all. Uh, to the torturer. Severian is really much raised to see the body as an object, uh, an object on which he performs his art. Um, you know, uh, how you excruciate, how you cause pain for someone, how you uh, restrain a prisoner, how you cause them pain to extract information, how you cause the most pain with the least injury if you have to, to extend these things uh, so you can get the most out of them, how you execute a person in an artful way, uh, there's a showmanship to it. You, we see that even in the guild's ceremony, which is interesting because it's Catherine of Alexandria, but there's also bits in there that are very much like, I think, uh, I think St. Agatha as well, including the strike said twice and the putting the head back on and things like that. Um, but um, so the kind of like the blending of these two virgin martyrs. But we see that like, because when you're thinking about celebrating Catherine of Alexandria, you know, as a patron, patron of torture, I mean, in one sense, it's the way that like, Oh, who's the martyr who was on the griddle and said, turn me over. So he's the patron of cooks. Like there's a certain kind of, of humor in that, that we do. That's uh, part of our, or St. Barbara's the patron of, of artillery because she prayed and the Lord struck her father dead with lightning, you know, because she prayed to be delivered from like this pagan, her pagan father's desire to like forcibly marry her off. So she couldn't be a virgin dedicated to Christ. So there is that kind of humor, how we do it, but there's a dark humor in, Oh, Catherine was broken on the wheel. But the, you know, and, and God stopped the wheel by in the hagiography, the growing of roses. And so oh, we have to behead her now. And then the Agatha kind of thing. But like um, the way these things are remixed as legend and something kind of, there's a bit of that kind of Catholic humorousness of how people are patron saints of things, but it's almost perversified so that Catherine is the patron saint of torture. I mean, it becomes a blasphemous yeah. thing. And they don't know that. To them, this is just, this is the story. Here's Holy Catherine. This is why she's our patroness and blesses us. They don't get it. Um, and I think that's part of it. Like Severian's relationship with women is in many respects. Even those descriptions and those, he views the body in some respects a thing, just a thing. And he, in his better moments, he knows that's not true, but that's part of his training. That's what the training brings out in him. Because you can't be a good man and do this without being broken in some way. And the way the torturers seem to get broken, or at least the better of them is, there's a disassociation of the body from the person. What you said about the techniques of torturers, I mean, it it, the, it makes it very clear, and this isn't, you know, even made totally explicit in the book to the degree that, you know, you might think hearing you talk about the torture, but like, uh, there is a flip side to all of that causing pain, you know, in viewing sex as a series of techniques to induce pleasure or, or whatever. But, you know, now he, he is not explicitly describing sexual acts or anything like that in, in the book. Uh, do you, But do you think he ever goes overboard? I mean, clearly, I don't think his intent was to titillate, but... 
I have never felt that. Like I've never read those passages in there knowing who Severian is and, and sometimes the clinical way he's describing them by remembering them. I've, I've never read them like that. I've always seen them as um, kind of twofold. One, that, that show, that torture thing. And also, since I compare this in some ways to the Confessions, what is one of Augustine's big things? And this is not to say Severian's Augustine or whatever, but there's parallels and like one of Augustine's huge problems is also his chastity, the difficulty that his habits led him to and to the point where he would pray, like he'd say he would pray in his struggles, God give me chastity, but not yet. There is a sense there played out a little bit in Earth of the New Sun. Severian goes through a very literal and also a very spiritual kind of rebirth. And he has a relationship with a woman who says he's, you know, like no one has ever been this tender and loving with me. And he's like, that's weird. I never thought of myself as that way. In fact, I'm pretty much sure I wasn't in any of my other relationships. And that's kind of a, a backhand it. Severian has changed and continues to change, and he's still not maybe where he needs to be, but he is a better man now than he was even when he left uh, to uh, to try to bring the new sun. And so I think that's... Yeah, that's... clearly it works on a story and character development level. The question, I guess, is more about, you know, the level of sort of the effect on the reader or the, the level of detail that Walsh uses. Sure. Is... Well, I don't, I don't think it verges to... I've never thought it verged to the level of obscene. I would also say that these things are, are, are difficult, especially for us now. I mean, even even in the decades since he wrote this, wrote the book, right, in the in the early 80s, right, as these books were published in like the early to mid 80s, like our culture has been perversified in so many huge ways. So I think that's part of it. To twofold, I think. It's easier for modern people who are dealing with the struggle to be affected by those passages in a way that people might not have, anybody but the worst kind of person, you know, the, the most the person having a major struggle like that wouldn't have been as mainstream would have in, in the 80s. I also think that we are, as Catholics, to fight that, we are also much more sensitive to those things. And part of that is a cultural thing where we have to be because that's how people try to smuggle things in, especially to our children and to the youth to, you know, to, to do that. So if people ask me for advice, I would say that I don't think it raises to the level of any kind of obscenity. I think he walks, it's a fine line. I think he walks it with pretty good craft. I would also say that we live in a, in a very difficult age for this kind of stuff. So be careful if you know you have issues uh, about those passages. And maybe if you skip them, you won't miss so there, I mean, these four, four volumes plus another fifth volume of a coda. You can get a lot out of here without yeah. reading the worst bits. And they yeah, are. Yeah, there's a sort of, there's, they're usually pretty short and you can kind of just. Yeah, it's like a paragraph or two, I think, at the most. Maybe I can uh, end here by reading a little paragraph from another story. I just want to give people a sample of his writing style and how evocative he can be. This is the opening paragraph of the fifth head of Cerberus, which I read today. And I think it's just, I don't know, if, you know, we don't necessarily need to discuss it, but I just think it's a nice. It's a nice paragraph. Uh, he, he, he kind of simultaneously evokes an atmosphere and kind of intrigues you with some strange details right off the bat. When I was a boy, my brother David and I had to go to bed early, whether we were sleepy or not. In summer, particularly, bedtime often came before sunset, and because our dormitory was in the east wing of the house, with a broad window facing the central courtyard and thus looking west, the hard, pinkish light sometimes streamed in for hours while we lay staring out at my father's crippled monkey perched on a flaking parapet, or telling stories, one bed to another, with soundless gestures. It's a pretty pretty good paragraph, I'd say. Yeah. It's very evocative of, like you mentioned earlier, Bradbury, that kind of wistfulness of childhood. And there's hints of perhaps a, a terror or a weirdness out there, and yet it also kind of if you have a good memory of your childhood, you can remember those kind of things being said to bed or what you thought was far too early. You know, a crippled monkey perched on a flaking parapet. Yeah. And that's normal to him, but also kind of creepy. And that's, right. you know, that explains a lot about childhood to some expense, doesn't it? That seems to normal to us because we don't know any better. And sometimes they're not as normal as we think. Actually, that story is very much like the Book of the New Sun in that it depicts a, a child born into perverse circumstances. Oh, Father, I think we should wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about Gene Wolfe with me. I, it was really enjoyable, and I, I hope we've intrigued some people anyway. So do I. I think, I think he's great. I think he, he always rewards rereading, but like, I, like I, I think I said before, 
the first time I finished one of his novels, especially, I'm like, that was great. I wish I understood it. I'll probably have to reread that in a couple of months and come at it fresh and go deeper into the text. I think that's always worthwhile. I think uh, that great literature does that, and I'm willing to call him great. You know, yes, I think Le Guin is right. He is SF and F's. He is speculative fiction's Melville, and I don't think that's blowing smoke. I think that's very true. And uh, I think that if there's justice in the world, he will be being read for a very long time, uh, both because he is fun and because he is uh, quite deep and quite skilled. May he rest in peace. Yeah. Amen. All right. Thanks, Father. Thank you. tell you the jacket shot i think that would be the best thing sure, to yeah. illustrate this man's extremely strange mind you know what a jacket shot is it's the promotional photo that your publisher puts on the jacket of your hardback book and these are mostly smiling ah, pictures of our author well gene got a request from his publisher we need a jacket shot and on hearing this he bought a crummy old jacket at a Goodwill. He called a friend in Indiana who was a gun collector, and he came he came down from Chicago area and put the jacket on the man's firing range, and they shot it full of holes. And then he took a picture of it, and that was the jacket shot. Although Jane was, as I say, a very amiable person, very well liked in the field, he unfortunately was the victim of several horribly embarrassing circumstances. One year at the Nebula Awards, and that's the professional award in the field, that's like the Oscars of the science fiction field. His, they read off the nominees, and one of them was his uh, short story, the, the Island of Dr. Death. And Isaac Asimov was reading this, and he said, ah, and the winner is Gene Wolfe. And everybody claps, and Gene walks up to collect his award. And then someone whispers to Isaac, no, um, he didn't actually win. Look at the card again. No award had won. Nobody had won that category. So a friend of Gene said, obviously, you have to write another story, The Death of Dr. Island. And that one did win a nebula. He also had one of the books of the New Sun was rather sabotaged in its sales because the distributor had not recorded it as a new book. And the booksellers thought, oh, this is an old book. We don't have to order this and put this on the shelf with the new books. He also uh, had the title of the last of the book of the New Sun mangled in the trade publication Locus, which is the newsletter of the science fiction world. And they recorded instead the Citadel of the Autark, the Castle of the Otter. So obviously oh, so he then had, he had to write a book, The Castle of the Otter. <laughs> Yeah, so and in addition to your uh, your story about the the uh, death of Do uh, the island of Doctor Death and other stories, and the death of Doctor Island, he also wrote, I believe, one or two, two more. Other yes, yes, yes. So he, he wrote uh, he the death of the island Doctor, and I don't know what the other one was. And yeah, he just I he just got the ideas from the titles. He just decided I'm going to yes. make up uh, different variations on this title, and then come up with a story, and they're really good. Yes. He was a very witty man. How did you get along with Harlan Ellison? Well, Harlan, I once... He was a famous... Was for, for those who don't know, he was a famously prickly person. <laughs> yes, he was. Well, I, I wrote a parody called The Passion and Martyrdom of St. Harlan Ellison and how he was torn apart by an enraged mob because he actually almost was at a convention once. I That's the closest I ever want to be to a link. Harlan had said something that offended the audience, and there was a general move towards the stage. Oh, wow. That's yeah, really yes. something. And a very large fan who looked exactly like the old football player, Roosevelt Greer, came up, normally a gentle person, but he looked like he was going to tear Harlan's head off after doing this. Well, Har yes, Harlan was prickly, but when I read The Passion and Martyrdom of St. Harlan, he said he was chilled and didn't want to think about it anymore. 
But I went to uh, dinner with him once, uh, several people, uh, the Silverbergs and the Del Reys, who are science fiction writers. And Harlan maneuvered till he sat by me. He had maneuvered to sit by me in the cab. And then he said, what is that on your finger, my dear? It's a wedding ring. Where is your husband? He's home watching the kids. Oh, think no more about it. Obviously, he knows what he's doing. So he didn't proposition me because I was married. <laughs> That's nice. Other ladies had not the same experience, but he did not. He never chased married women. Uh, Harlan, Do you, uh... eventually, in Harlan's defense, uh, his fifth marriage lasted for 30 years, and he was very devoted, and his wife was very devoted to him. He just had a while getting it right. Maybe he figured something out. Dear, uh, he was a very dear friend of, of Gene's. I said Gene could be, uh, interact with anybody. Are there any other stories that uh, jump out at you? Uh, well, I have you of, of, of famous sci-fi authors that, that you know. <laughs> uh, well, we, we could be on this for hours. I avoided being pinched by Isaac Asimov. Oh, yeah? Oh, boy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Isaac was very free with his hand, shall we say. And ladies of my age did not think this was funny. Although it was a big joke, oh, Isaac likes to pinch the girls. Well, he approached me with his hands out, and I grabbed his wrists and put them down, and he did not touch me. If I if he had touched <laughs> me, I'm, I would have hit him. I'm not. Wow. I'm not well, kidding. good for you. Wow. <laughs> that wasn't the story I, I expected to hear, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's that's one of them. I was particularly connected with Paul Anderson and Gordon Dixon both of whom have been dead for 20 years, but their works are still in print. I wrote a lot of critical works about them. I did costumes based on uh, both their uh, characters that both of them had created. And I did Gordy Dixon's research for about 25 years. Not the only person who did his research, but I, I did some of it. And um, he was a very sweet, affable teddy bear who could not be trusted to go out for the ice at the party because someone would waylay him and lead him off to another party. We would listen for his footsteps as he came back to the door. Uh, science fiction used to be a very cozy little community when we were all poor and honest, and we knew each other, and we sort of lived in each other's pockets, and you got to know maybe too much about people, but now it's a huge commercial thing. They make profitable movies out of science fiction, George Martin. I saw George Martin for years at conventions and I never spoke to him. We just didn't move in the same circles. Had I known he was going to become this famous, maybe I would have made an effort, but uh, we, we, never, we never met. As a result of going to science fiction conventions and meeting people and making friends, I was a model for the illustrator Kelly Freeze. He put me on numbers of SF book covers when in my salad days, which are long past. I'm, I'm an old lady now. I've had books dedicated to me. I have had a song, a song was written about the characters in my own novel, which I then incorporated into the second edition of the novel. I wrote a song that was recorded. I won prizes at the art show. And because I traded art at his invitation with the artist of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, he got me on a list to be an official artist at the 1975 launch of the Apollo Soyuz project. Yeah, I, I knew a lot of the artists. We, we collected uh, science fiction art. They're all dead now except Vincent DeFate. And it was a grand old time, but the, the world has changed and the old ways have have vanished. The big conventions are just commercial promotional things, you're not going to be able to sit in the bar with your favorite author and hear yeah. him tell funny stories. With some social justice uh, drizzled in there. Oh, Lord, yes. Uh, don't get, I, I don't want thing. to get on that, but after you stop recording, I'm going to tell you something. Perhaps I can have you on again at greater yes. length to talk about oh, yes. sci-fi in general. Might, you might want to have me talk about some of the writers who either were Catholic or wrote books that were of interest to Catholics. Yeah, let's let's do that at some point. Now, can you recommend something for people to read that you've written? Well, I wrote two versions of the same novel, and you can find it. Do not pay an extravagant price for this. It's a simple little, it was called 
originally Dream Rider, and then it was called Shaman. I co-edited something that's more accessible you might find in a library. I co-edited and contributed to an anthology of essays about the religious aspects of J.R. Tolkien's work. It's called Light Beyond All Shadow. It is uh, published by Roman and Littlefield, co-edited with Professor Paul Carey of Brigham Young. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this. Yeah. If you want to see what I do, and particularly for the Catholic press, just Google me.